Another episode of the Swans Cast. We've got a big show going on tonight. I am joined by Rowan, otherwise known as Migs from Big Footy. Rowan, how are you doing? Not bad, Justin. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem at all. How's your weekend been? Oh, nice. It's a long weekend in Perth, so it's still going technically, but give me a few more hours and it's back to work, so it's enjoying a couple of beers. Nothing better than kicking back, drinking some beers and chatting about the Swans. Too right. All right, so for tonight's show... We're going to talk about heroes and villains of the weekend. We're also going to have a brief chat about the Suns and the Pies games and the very unfortunate parallel with the Swans performances of late. We're also going to talk about Mark Robinson's incredibly insensitive tweet that he put out last week. We've got Tom Hawkins and his jumper punches. I'll bet you Zach Jones is counting his stars on that one. We're going to talk about Alira Lira and Shaki from the Lions. We've got Jared Hartbrow, legend, 0.108. We've got a talk about our finals hopes, and definitely what needs to go right for us to make it. We're going to look at the run-in, we've got the Dogs game coming up, we're going to talk about our recent head-to-head record, and we're going to talk about the key matchups and predictions, and we're going to answer a couple of questions that came in for us today. All right, Rowan, so would you like to kick us off with your Hero of the Week? No worries, Justin. Yep, Hero of the Week is probably Josh Kelly from the Giants. Uh, well, for a 22-year-old with all the, the media circus following him, about his uh, contract renewal, you know, he's not letting the pressure get to him. I think he had 20-odd touches to halftime on the weekend. Just chopped the game up. Three more Brownlow votes. Oh, he was superb. He's into the third third line in the favouritism, so, yeah, not too bad. Yeah, the, the amount of money they're talking about, you know, especially in North Melbourne. What was it, 1.8 1. 1. 1. million? Well, yeah, I think Essendon was 1.6 million or some, some rubbish figure. Do you think he's worth 1.6 million? He could be, not just yet, but as they say, you've got you to gotta pay for potential. So no one thought Tom Boyd was worth a million, but he probably won him a grand final last year in that, that, that last quarter. So, No, as they say, you know, that was a $1 million game. That's it, he paid so, him back. Oh, yeah, he paid him back in spades. You could say the same about Franklin as well. Franklin's done the same for the Swans. Oh, Franklin's been a bargain. He's, he's carried the team, showing it this year. You know, give him a longer contract. You pay you pay him double for what he's given us at the moment. Definitely, definitely. Have you got a villain of the week? Oh, it's got to be Jack Darling from the Eagles. Oh, let's hear it. Well, Kennedy goes down with an ankle, an Achilles, a calf, whatever it was. You're relying on Jack Darling to stand up, be the main guy down forward, and what does he do? Back to bloody grand final form, goes missing, can't do anything. We've got another week. Oh, it's, it's an unfortunate trend with him. He, uh, he does tend to go missing when he's needed the most. All right, now for my hero of the week, can't really go past Joel Selwood. We've got three premierships, countless All-Australians, countless best and fairests. Uh, The guy is an absolute champion of the game. A lot of people criticise him because of the way he goes about it, the way he wins the ball. People call him Docker because his head's down at the ball, and he does win his fair share of high free kicks. Let's not sort of dodge that issue, but... If you guys haven't seen what happened on the weekend, the way he was absolutely cleaned up and stood up like it was nothing with his scalp just hanging off, it was fantastic. It was really reminiscent of a guy who is probably one of the hardest players in the football. What do you think, Rowan? Well, he definitely got all his ducks in a row on the weekend. Um, He got knocked out a couple of times, (laughs) came back on, smashed it, controlled the game, and just dragged him over the line at the end there. And No doubt he's a great player, but... Yeah, questionable tactics, but you can't deny that he's a good player. So, oh man, that that hit by Laird was that was something out of the you know out of this world. The fact the fact that he just got straight back up and it was like, oh yeah, no, what's this up, lad? Yeah, no worries, mate. Yeah, had a bit bit of a five inch gash across his head, a few staples, and back into it. So, I mean, we come to expect it now from him, but he can play. So, oh, no question there. Now, my villain of the week, none other than Mark Robinson. Now, have you had the pleasure of actually seeing this tweet? I did happen to read it, and what an absolutely idiotic comment. Uh, But, I mean, it's come to be expected, really. He's had a bit of a history of saying stupid things, whether he's had a couple of breakfast beers and then he's jumped on the old Twitter or not. Who knows? But uh, for everything 
everything the AFL does to support mental health, it just shows, you know, just goes to show that we've still got a long way to go when idiots like this are in the mainstream media, potting a bloke. I thought it was absolutely incredible the fact that he had really had to say it. Like Alex, Alex Solo's had his issues, and he's come clean on it, and he's been public about it. And Collingwood's really supported him on the way that he's gone about it, and they've come out and said, "Yes, you can take a break, but you can train. We want you to train. If you want to train, you can train." And and for those who haven't seen it, Mark Robinson. He quotes Glenn McFarlane's um, tweet, which says, Fantastic to see Alex of Solo back on the track for Collingwood just days after news he was battling, battling depression and taking a break from the game. Mark Robinson, good drugs. Clinical depression on Tuesday, training Thursday. What a dope. Idiot. Oh, un- undoubtedly. And as I was talking to you earlier, you said he was on AFL 360 and apologizing. Do you know what he said there? Well, it was almost as bad as the tweet, just the way he, you know, does the usual Robbo, sits there with his stupid look on his face, takes a couple of deep breaths, looks over to Jared, then rambles on about, I shouldn't have said it, nothing gives me that right, blah, blah, blah. It, it's really a shame that he didn't come out and own it from the get-go, and look, this isn't something he put out last night, he put it out in the middle of last week, um, and I thought it was really disappointing from, just from an AFL supporter's perspective, to just see someone say something so incredibly wrong like that, considering everything that's been going on recently, especially with the Franklin. In any case, I thought it was just really, really bad to see. It was a really bad look. It was a very bad look from someone who has a lot of influence in AFL and in sports, considering he is the chief AFL writer at the Herald Sun. And for him to not only say that, but also have material like that published, it's such a, such a bad reflection on what is an iconic Melbourne newspaper to have him say something so stupid. Especially with a couple of high-profile cases in the last few years. You've got Buddy Franklin, who arguably you know, swans chances down the drain, and we can't blame him at all because you've, you've got to sort your health out first. And I think it was Mitch Clark a couple of years back That's before it, that. That's it, Mitch Clark, yes. Yeah, yeah. Went from, uh, and that, yeah. that was probably the highest-profile one. Um, and there are other players who have dealt with that problem, uh, especially over the last 10 years. And I think it's now really within the last couple of years that mental health problems have really come to the fore and have been embraced as this is an actual problem that has to be supported and dealt with. But, um, yeah, look, a half-assed apology from a half-assed journalist who really does half-assed work, so I'm not I'm not surprised. What about you? No, no we just, like I said, it's not, not really, nothing surprising. It's come to ex- be expected from him. He's got a history of just saying moronic things. Comes out the next night with his stupid half-assed apology. Yeah, that's true. It is, yeah, it is what it is. That's Mark Robertson. Uh, you get good with a bad. Unfortunately, you get a lot of bad with some good. And typically, you get more bourbon than you get good from him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yeah, move, moving, on, moving on from the drunk. We, we, um, did you by any chance happen to catch the Suns game on the weekend? I think there's some uh, parallels with how the Suns went about it, especially the way the Eagles played. I didn't actually how get, we went. I didn't actually catch it, no. So to key you in, the Eagles started off okay, started off positively, and the Suns worked their way back into the game, and they fought back, they fought back, and in the third quarter, you know, they were really on top, they got in front, and then the Eagles really came back hard, 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 and they got a couple of goals up, which, uh, just shy of two goals up, which sounds a fair bit like how Sydney played, and a um, bit of reversal there, though, but then the, but then the uh, Suns, they kicked the last two goals of the game. Yeah, I think I, I caught the end where was it two meter Peter took that mark and slotted it from fifty. Oh, yeah. I seen that one to put him in front. Then he had another chance. I think he missed it, but that's fantastic to see though. Someone, someone like him to do to do that at the end of the game, especially when he's had his own sort of goal kicking issues. Especially yips out in front of the goal. Exactly, and he's not he's not the main target up forward. You got Tommy Lynch, who's going to be a you know if he's not already a gun. Um, it's just good for him. I think he kicked a few goals last year, but it would do his confidence. You know, a lot of good. I think also it's really good to see that that you know the Suns are actually starting to play a game, a game style, a brand of football, if you will, as dour and ugly as it was. You know, they got the win. That's all that matters. And yeah. man, the Eagles, the Eagles have got their road problems. Man, they cannot win anywhere except Perth at the moment. Nah, it's just the classic flat track bullies. I think they've been they've been getting called that for years, and nothing's changed. 
something between the ears, a bit of mental weakness. I'm not too sure, but um, they've been called Mummy's Boys over here in the papers, um, <laughs> yeah, which is yeah. a, not a bad name. So, man, they need to they need to take the wives and the wags over when they go. You know, just so they can be babied when they're over there. Yeah, feel like they're at home, you know, in the crash. Yeah, exactly. Maybe maybe take the old caravans over. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but uh, it really is a surprise to see them play so poorly, to be honest. Oh, they're they're easily a five goal better team at home. I just you can't work them out. If they learned how to win in Melbourne, they'd be all right, top four. But they can't. So another year of Eagles premiers twenty seventeen down the drain. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like as soon as I go past that, uh, there's a divide where Adelaide is. You know, you draw a line straight up the guts of Australia past Adelaide. Cannot win. But they can win in Adelaide. Yeah, it's just weird. Who knows? Only they know. It's got to be between the years. So. Oh, absolutely. And another game, another game on the weekend. I think uh, Collingwood showed how it's done. Down two players in yes. a very similar situation to the Swans. They had a... Yes. Uh, I can't remember who it was. An injury right at the start of the game, and then they were down a second player before half time, just like this one's. Yeah, it just showed what a decent coach and a new, you know, change it up game plan can do. Lost a couple of players, didn't let that get in the way, fought hard, won it at the end. I think uh, Dugowie, was it, went off. Uh, Gold yeah, sack, did so. his shoulder. Uh, Jamie Elliott, an ankle or a, a lower leg, something. He kicked a few goals, and uh, yeah, they just showed what what you can do with a few rotations down if you've got an actual game plan that uh, isn't just one-dimensional like a certain other team seems to have at the moment. <laughs> just a bit of a subtle dig there as well. G'day, horse. G'day, horse, yeah. Uh, look, I thought, it was, um, I thought it was a tremendous win considering the fact that they did it over in, they did it over in uh, Western Australia and that is not an easy road trip. It's a tough road trip. And, you know, Fremantle, they were there. They were there right at the end of the game. They brought it level. They got a point in front in the last quarter. And then the Pies, you know, they ran away with it. They kicked the last four goals. And, you know, the Dockers, they kicked three points. You can't win a game if you're kicking three points against a team that's down two players in the last quarter. They've got to be killed by that point. That's right. Lockie Neal had a shot. I think it was 30, 35 out straight in front. You know, you're going to be a professional AFL footballer. I could kick that down at the park on a Sunday and you're telling me these blokes that are on half a million a year can't kick a ball through two sticks from 30 metres out. Yeah, I know. But, uh, you know, in all credit, Collingwood outplayed them. Uh, And, you know, I I bring up those two games because there are parallels between the Suns' victory and the Collingwood victory with what the Swans did against the Hawks. And, I mean, if you really want to talk about weekend results, you can't go past... The absolute shit fest that was Thursday night. Um, I laughed myself stupid when I saw the halftime score. I couldn't. I couldn't even believe my eyes. It was definitely one of the great moments. Please tell me you knew about this game. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> I couldn't believe it. The greatest moment of 2017. Watching the scum get pumped, but then it's sort of bittersweet because what does that? What does that make Sydney? You know, the shit we dished up the week before. Hawthorne comes out, gets pumped. Where does that put us? Well, do you remember, I think it was last year, or might have been the year before, when Port Adelaide got the real fast start on Hawthorne, and they were up by 45, 50 points in the second quarter? Yep, and they chipped away, chipped away. Yep, at least this time, you know, the power, they strangled him, grabbed him by the yep. neck, and that was it. We said it, we said buddy strangled Luke Hodge while they were at it. <laughs> buddy sniper. Tell you what, you're not alone and only wishing that. No, oh, man, that guy, that guy needed to retire. Oh, it was pretty frustrating to watch us make him look like a champion of the game again a couple of weeks ago. Was... Oh, he's a decent player. He's a good player. He's led him well, but cheap shot merchant if you've ever seen one. Yeah, no doubt about that. All right. Now, we've touched briefly on the Mark Robinson's tweet, but, um, well, I was a little bit surprised to find that there really hadn't been too much sort of feedback from the AFL and the greater journalistic community about this. Are you disappointed by that? Oh, I didn't hear a thing, so definitely disappointed. Should have been made to, to do something when he did it, not have the weekend to think about a bullshit excuse. You know, he's had his, he's probably had his PR riders on it all weekend. How can I not, not look like a dickhead? Yeah, it was just, just poorly handled. But we all knew it was coming tonight on 360. You just knew it was going to be the, you know, the usual Robbo apology. Sit there, look sorry. Five minutes later, he's up and about about Jake Stringer or some other. Well, I don't know. I haven't watched it. Now, did they bring up Tom Hawkins at all? 
the jumper punch they did. Yes. Now, I reckon Zach Jones is going to be counting his lucky stars here. Uh, Zach Jones is a lucky boy. He is a very lucky boy. Tom Hawkins, he's got some form here. Last year, he got done for a week doing the same thing. And if he's not going to learn last year and he's not going to learn this year, then when is this city going to learn? He's a good footballer. Just give him a week for stupidity. I mean, it's been all over the news. You can't tell me the players don't know. And he comes out and did a little jumpery. Sure, Crouch went down, but... You know, you're going to put yourself in that position. You're going to have to cop it. And he copped a week, and that's good. That little jumper, he was, uh, was a bit of an epic jumper punch. <laughs> well, I mean, he's, what, six foot six, 110 kilos. It's got to be a bit behind yeah. it. So, I mean, sure, Crouch could have stood up, but, you know, trying to get a free kick. Oh, you milked it, and um, he flushed him, and that's the end of the story, you know? That's it. Give him a week for stupidity. So, it is what it is. Exactly. Look, and I don't know if that's going to be drawing, you know, the line in the sand kind of kind of stance the AFL's going to have. and. Um, you know when you when you've got um, when you've got Bartel coming out each week saying you know give us some more controls give us some more controls we want to do something about this but we can't do anything. Well, I tell you what, I reckon Tom Hawkins has thrown him a big old fat bone there. Yeah, I was a bit surprised. Well, I wasn't wasn't surprised, but it was always going to be he's going to look after his old teammate. But I think uh, I think the saying is execute one to teach a million. So <laughs> yeah. that's it. Tommy Tommy copped it. If you're going to execute one, you might as well execute the guy with a bit of history. Yeah, exactly. I mean, put himself in that position, he deserves it. So, I don't know who they're playing. I don't know who they're playing. I think they got the bye this week, but whoever they're playing next week is going to be nice and thankful. So, Oh, yeah, absolutely. And look, you know, just let's point out, he's not a dirty player. He's just... No, definitely not, no. He's just known to do a couple of stupid things on the field. Just, uh, you know, maybe he's just a big dumb full forward. Who knows? But, you know, he's got he's to be better than that. Oh, that's very true. That's very true. That sort of segues us into, um, since we're talking about tall players... Let's have a quick chat about Alir Alir and uh, Shaki from the Brisbane Lions. So Alir Alir, uh, I brought up last week, and I've also talked about this in the blog, as I think he's been pretty hard done by by the club, in that this year, the way he's been sort of managed, he was rushed back well before he was ready, especially coming back from injury, and he wasn't particularly fit to begin with. And he came in, he was okay, he wasn't very good, but he wasn't the worst in the team. And he started to improve, but then the... Coaches, they dropped him, and that was fair enough. He needed it. He went back. He was right as rain before the Lions game until they held an impromptu training session on the Saturday morning, which he either missed or turned up late to, depending on who you talk to. And then they forced him to do the Brisbane Lions warm-up all by himself while the rest of the team went out. And since then, he spent the rest of the sort of like the last sort of four weeks in the reserves. He hasn't even got a look in. What do you make of the situation? All I can think is that there's something going on behind the scenes that we don't know about, obviously, because talent-wise, he'd be in the team. If he can't get a game without injuries down back, then there's got to be more to it. So I don't know whether it's attitude at training. Maybe that's not the first time he's missed training. Who knows? Um, but on talent alone, it's just funny how going into the grand final last year, he was one of our key outs that you know could have swayed the game. And now we can't even get a game with all our injuries. So Absolutely. Just makes me think there's got to be more going on in the back. Oh, look, so. and Andrew raised it last week. He said, you know, in the depth of despair with the Swans defensive situation, you know, you've got someone who's regarded as an elite intercept defender after 10 games and can't even get a game. Something's going exactly. on. Exactly. I mean, he doesn't need to be the lockdown defender that Horse, I don't know, he's saying he's going to work on his defensive ability. Obviously, he's a defender, but, you know, you've got Grundy, you've got Melican. They can you be got the lockdown. as well. Let him have a runoff half back or something, you know? Just ramp his back in. Let him let him do what he does best. Exactly. I, I just can't see why he's not getting a game. He's gone from being number one intercept at the club to uh to not getting a game. So I don't know how he's performing at NEFL level. Probably Grimlock would be the man to talk to there, but um yeah, it's gotta be it's gotta be something there. You're from out west, you're a Perth boy. Have there been any sort of uh, rumours coming down the grapevine? Any sort of noise out west that us Eastern Swan supporters wouldn't know about? Oh, maybe a couple of rumours circling that he may be in the yellow and yellow and uh, blue within a couple of years, but you know, not too not too sure how solid the source is. But th- th- that'd be even worse, considering I can't stand the uh, Eagles. <laughs> and we'll, so then it's the dilemma: do you keep playing him and developing him if he's on his way anyway, or do you just? Let him sit in the reserves. So, yeah. you know, do you want to put the hard work in if he's not going to re-sign, if you're just going to make him a better player for someone else? I think if he spends more time in the reserves, then something is most definitely going on. And 
you know, there there has been a bit of chatter on uh, on the Facebook groups. There's been a little tiny sprinkling on Twitter, but there has been a fair bit on the big footy boards. And people are talking about the fear of losing Aaliyah, Aaliyah, especially if he wants to go back to Perth. And we saw the same happen with Lewis Jetta a couple of years ago. He was great for us. He was such an important player in 2012. And then he improved in 2013 and 14, and he became a really important player for us. But young Perth-based family, and he wants to go back. Could we see the same with Aaliyah Aaliyah? Yeah, I think it might be a possibility. Um, if, he, if he can't get a game and... To be honest, the horse has got a bit of a history of uh, singling out a few players here and there. Tommy Mitchell yep. couldn't get a game racking up 75 possessions. Yeah. Um, you know, what chance does Aaliyah have to- down back? I'll tell you so, what, man. Tommy Mitchell's... You can't can't blame him if he leaves. Tommy Mitchell got 60-odd in the NFL and he got almost 60-odd in the AFL. You know, if that doesn't tell you something, to, I don't know what else will. Exactly. He, he's either slept with Horse's daughter or who knows. He's got or some... Uh, with Horse himself. Something's going on in the background there. Maybe he woke up next to him. Hey. <laughs> 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 Too far. You're not Barry. <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows? To be honest, I would just hate to see Aaliyah become some sort of whipping boy or a bit of a lightning rod. Uh, yeah, that would be a shame. Um, and you know what's going to happen? He's going to he's going to leave and he's going to turn into an all Australian oh, defender. Yeah. People people will be on big footy having a crack. Oh, you let him go. You let him go. Another Tom Mitchell. Yep. So, oh, all your money's in Buddy. You you can't hold your players. Blah blah yeah. blah. So that's uh, it's definitely a concern. That's so the unfortunate downside. Hopefully he can work on whatever he has to and come yeah, back. absolutely. And you can only hope that if there is something that he's working on, he works on it and improves and he comes back from it. And if there is some issue behind the scenes, then, you know, they come back from that. He's a great defender. I just hope that it's, uh, yeah, I just hope it's football-based and not yeah. attitude-based or that sort of thing. So if it's a little little adjust to his uh, to his playing style then he's just going to have to do oh, it. Oh, look, so. even if he was Cam McCarthy or Harley Bennell, I'd still give him a crack. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, those those guys were off the, you know, they were way off the rail. They went off the track big time. I think I think Harley was giving himself a crack, oh, wasn't he? Oh, he was. I think he was blowing smoke up his own ass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, so that also leads us into uh, Shaki from the Brisbane Lions. And I want to talk about Shaki as well because it's an interesting parallel between Alira Lira as well. But... The difference being that Shaki, he's got one or two years less than Aaliyah Aaliyah, but also there is that very strong go-home factor. And the fact that Brisbane Lions have actually come out and said, we will not we will not continue to play you in the AFL if you don't want to play. So, Well, it's just, uh, all that's pointing to attitude problems again. Um, homesick, obviously, but you know he's only a young guy. He's got the world at his feet. He's got a couple of blokes down there now probably in front of him in the packing order, so Hipwood is going to be a star. Oh, unquestionably. Um, and just what, what's it going to do to his confidence now? Is he going to go back to the NFL and just drop his head, or is he going to work hard, work on getting a new contract with a I don't know, Melbourne team, whatever? Interesting to see how he handles it. very much like Cam McCarthy a couple of years ago. I'm out of here. See you guys later. I'm not coming back. Yeah. I remember reading about that. Yeah, like, he, uh, seriously, what's going on there? Yeah, he was a, that was a bit of a dog act holding the uh, Giants to ransom, and they did the right thing, just said, Piss oh, off. Playing the reserves, and we'll get rid of you in two years. Yeah. Pop that. So you don't want to. No you don't want to be here. You don't want to train. See you later. <laughs> exactly. And now he's, he's showing what type of player he is at Fremantle. An absolute spud. So they got rid of Zach Dawson and just uh, brought in hipster Zach Dawson and put him up forward. And uh, <laughs> you know, with his shit moustache and his stupid man bun, um, yeah, just needs to worry about getting a goal. Yeah, so. absolutely. I, I think there's there's similarities between Alir and Alir and Shaky in a way. In Shaki's problems, they are attitude problems. Yeah, there's a bit of talk about homesickness and whatnot. Okay, fair enough. Maybe he's got all his mates and family back in back in Seymour and Victoria. And, you know, that could be a genuine factor if he's never actually left the house before and he's never socialized before. But he's 19, turning 20 years old. He's got his own car. I mean, he can jump on a plane. He can take a weekend off. He's a phone call away. Internet, just jump on, you know, iChat, whatever. That's Shaki for you, and I can only hope that Alira Lear is not going through the same problems and that it is really just something football-related to work on. And hopefully it's just something like tightening up, playing man-on-man, being a bit more accountable defensively, or just working on his defensive positioning because we really need him. But uh, speaking of players up north in Queensland, um, have you heard about uh, the legend Jared Harbrow? You know, party hardy. 
I did happen to catch the uh, tail end on the news. Uh, old Jared, I think he's gone out and uh, celebrated a few, you know, with a few of the boys, had a few beers, and uh, what was he, point one oh point one oh eight? Yeah, point one oh eight. He's blown a big one. Yeah, so that's a fair few bevies. Um, yeah, he's he's necked a few, and that's what I don't get with these AFL guys. You know, they're on what minimum two hundred k a year, minimum. And you're telling me these blokes can't afford a taxi from wherever they are back this, to their this house. This guy, he was cherry picked from uh, from the dogs, I believe, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. So he's going to be on a fair bit more than two hundred k. He's got to be at least exactly. But I'm just saying, you know, even, even if you're on two hundred k, what's a bloody hundred dollar taxi fare? Idiots, idiots. I wish I was on 200k. If I was earning that, yeah, Ubers, taxis, no worries. I'll hire a limousine for a night. Because I'm on 40k a year and I spend 50 bucks on a taxi, you know? It's just. It's a bit of a shock, that one. But <laughs> look, not much is going right at the Suns and they're probably just pissing up every time they win something. Yeah, well, it's. Uh, I don't know whether it's pointing to their culture, but they've got a, got a bit of a history up there. Oh, they so. certainly do. I think Blue and McKenna, I think it was really wrongly treated on that, especially the way they said, oh, look, all the cultural problems at a football club. You know, they're, they're his responsibility, his fault, because they had they had the division between Gary Ablett and his kind of, I, I can't remember what they called it, but the nickname was the God Squad, and then the rest of the club, and there was a very big division there, and then there was also Harley Bennell going off, there was a bunch of other players just getting drunk and pissing up every weekend, and, and playing up and acting up, but at the time, they were winning games, so it was a bit like Collingwood's right squad, they won a premiership, they were winning games. You know, the Suns, they were winning games, they were playing well. In comes Eid, see you later, culture, what happens? They start losing games by a very big margin. Yep, down the toilet. So, I mean, maybe maybe the Swans should, should swoop, swoop while we can and uh, try and pick up Stephen May. Send Tippett up there, pay his wage, get rid of the crab and just uh, send Stephen May down. <sighs> I was thinking that, send Tippett for, tip for Lynch, man. Be killing it, absolutely. Lynch? Yeah, the guy can kick a goal. The guy's good for 60 goals a season. Lynch is worth 10 tippets, oh, so I don't think Gold Coast would be that stupid. I mean, I think Stephen May, I think, is out of contract next year, or it might even be this year. I'm not too sure, but he's going to be a full, you know, all Australian fullback for the next 10 years. So if it takes getting rid of Tippett, do if it. If he can clean up his act and he stops getting himself suspended, 100%. I'd take him with the suspensions. Yeah. He's worth it. It's it's what you've got got an all Australian fullback missing three weeks a year through punching someone, or you've got a forward ruck that misses twelve games a year through injury. Just so, by tripping his over his shoelaces, you know, man. Exactly, yeah. Mister Glass or hitting guys with a glass jaw. Oh, no doubt he was. You know, Tippett was on form a couple of years back. Oh but yeah, I'm not too sure the game he got injured in, but since then he's just hasn't bounced back. Whether he's given up or he did his, uh, I believe it was his uh, hamstring. He did it against GWS last year. Or his knee. Um, and he was really good up until that point. But look, if if I had a choice of player to get in the, in the AFL, and I know that they've sort of talked about this on a couple of boards, Stephen May, absolutely. Talia, can't get a look in. Malikin, he's not a fullback. There's another kid we picked up who could be a fullback. But let's face it, you want to take a ready-made player. Is that Jack Malbom? The choice between him and May, I mean, you'd... You'd bend over a barrel and say, you know, soccer to me, mate. Come play for the Swans. <laughs> what do you get up to on the weekend, Justin? It's none of my yeah, business. No, I was up there trying to charm May, I'll tell you what. <laughs> 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 but no, I mean, that Jack, you got, is it Jack Maybaum yeah, yeah. or Maubaum, however you pronounce it? He was an all Australian fullback. For the other 18s, yeah. In his junior years. Yeah, so are you telling me this? I don't know whether he's on the rookie list or he's been promoted, but. If Tali is not getting a game with all our injuries, same deal. Something's going on. Attitude problem. Who knows? I mean, you got Talia and his uh, rumble in the alleyway last year, remember? Yeah. Rumours are, though, that it was uh, a certain other club. One of their players was with <laughs> yeah. him at the time. So, you know, you've got to be careful here what yeah, we say. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I think he was, he was thrown under the bus oh, there. So, time. How many other AFL players are out there with, we're not talking trafficking amounts. Obviously, it's not, it's not a good thing. Stupid but, amount. Enough to get party, but yeah. oh look, this I was uh, I was a bit surprised the Swans chucked him under the bus, but <laughs> they did. Oh, For better yeah. or worse, he's uh, dug his hole and he's owning it. Who knows? Maybe he's he's getting back on the crack now, and that's why he's not getting the game. So <laughs> there's people that know more than us, so it's a bit you, you can't really judge. Yeah, I mean, true, true. Yeah, it's got to be something well, going apparently on. Apparently, he's doing all right, so maybe the cracks boosting him up. You know, 
Well, I think he got 28 touches yeah, last he was week in the NEFL. I think I read somewhere. Amongst so. the best in the NEFL, but then again, they were playing a very yep. poor Gold Coast side. So the. Uh, oh, to, to be fair, though, the, the NEFL isn't the greatest. No, it's not. Gauge of form, even if they're playing, well, maybe GWS aside. Yeah, but, true. Or the uh, Sydney you know, Uni, funny enough. Yeah, it's probably. I mean, the Waffle Reserves teams over here would pretty much pants any of the NEFL teams apart from the big two. So. When you got team scoring two hundred and another team scoring twelve, you know something's you know you, you know the balance just no, isn't it's Sunday bad. league stuff. I mean, yeah. it's like Sunday Sunday footballers against you know almost league footballers. Yeah, the disparity in that competition is ridiculous. So although he played well and he racked up a lot of possessions, you got to wait until he does it against a good forward and a good team to really get a good sort of idea about can he actually play. Yeah, that's right, and that's another case for bringing back the reserves teams. Yeah, pretty much. You know? I think what was in 96, I think was the last year the Swans had a reserves team. Um, at least you're playing against the VFL teams, which are a better standard. So. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, they'll never do it. No, they'll never do it, but, you know. It's, 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 well, with Talia's hopes of getting another football game uh, almost done and dusted, I guess you could uh, almost say our finals hopes for the season are uh, teetering on the edge. Teetering on the teetering edge. Teetering on the edge, or, man, uh, it's on the abyss. full-blown off the cliff, Justin. <laughs> It's a, yeah, it'll be a, it'll be a miracle. by thread, that's all it is at the these days. We've got a bit of a run in. So straight after the bye, we've got the dogs. We've got the dogs coming up on lost. Thursday. And then we have the and Tigers. Lost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, let, let's, start, let's start with the dogs. Do you think we can beat the dogs? Depends who turns up. If it's the Swans that have turned up for 90% of this year, no, no chance. chance. Yep, agreed. Um, you know, the, you got, well, see how the umpires are uh, interpreting this week's rule of the week. That's another thing to, to look we'll out about, for. We'll find out about that on the weekend, by the way, or on Thursday night. Thursday night, and then we'll have you know John Longmire, his usual, seeking clarification for the next week to deflect all the blame off his, of his own inability to get the best out of arguably one of the most talented lists in the NFL. Are we but... potentially talking about the Collingwood game here? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then we've got uh, afterwards, uh, in I think, believe, nine days afterwards, we've got Richmond at the MCG. Now, um, loss. I'll just <laughs> just touch lightly on on Richmond. Apart from that absolute pounding we gave them uh, last year, which was hilarious. It was the best thing. We've actually got a pretty bad run against them. We. Um, We'd actually lost five of the last seven games, or six of the last nine against the Tigers, and the majority of them were at the MCG as well. Yeah, loss. And you just know that it's going to happen that one of their no-name players will never do anything else for his career, but he'll pop up, kick five, win it for him, or he'll kick a goal after the siren like Lloyd. Oh, yeah. And then go back to being mediocre you know, for the rest of his career. It's just how the Swans go. That was one extremely depressing game. But, uh, yeah, I don't even know how that happened. We've well, got Lloyd kicking a goal after the siren. Then you've got Ben Griffiths, oh. who would struggle to get a game in the East Fremantle Reserves he struggled team. Struggled to get a game after chops that us game. Up and kicks, you know, chops, chops us up, kicks four <laughs> or five <laughs> goals, smashes us. You look like a superstar. Oh, what, I'm there yeah. at the ground. I'm like, what are you guys doing? You look at him, look like a legend, man. I'd even recruit him if he could play like this every week. It was that bad. I was waiting for Ty Vickery to actually get a touch. Well, he got touches last weekend. Well, we've got a knack of letting the worst players look like superstars, I tell you what. And then... Uh, yep, that's uh, yeah. It's all down to the game plan. How about you man up a... Just man up a team that's known for their uncontested ball and can pick you apart. But no, we'll just let all you blokes off the leash, you know, kick it to yourselves. Yeah, have it on a string, why not? <laughs> yep. Then, we've, G'day, then we've got Essendon. Then we've got Melbourne at the MCG. Essendon is at the SCG, by the way. Then we've got the Gold Coast at the SCG. Uh, it's a uh, 4.35 Saturday afternoon game, by the way. And then oh, that's, that's and then great. the run really starts. <laughs> we've got GWS at Spotless the following week. Then we've got St. Kilda at the SCG. Then we've got Hawthorne at the MCG. Geelong at Simmons. And finally, we've got the bye against Fremantle in round 21. So from that list, I've counted four yeah, wins. Pretty much. And then it gets better. So no it gets finals. Better. we got Adelaide, round 22 in Adelaide. 
and then we've got our arch nemesis Colton at the SCG. Oh, there's another win. That's another <laughs> I don't know, man. The way so we, there we go. We'll, we'll finish finish with what nine. No, the wins. way we played against at the MCG, I'm picking Colton for that one. <laughs> yeah, no. If we can't beat them at the you know the SCG, Something's then something's uh, gone wrong. No, nah. nine wins for the year. I think after hearing that. Oh yeah. Although, funnily enough, I was checking out the old TAB today, yep. and for some some crazy reason, Sydney are going into the next four or five games as favourites. I don't know what's going on there. Dollar seventy five against the Dogs this week. Something ridiculous the week after. Um, just couldn't believe it. Yeah. So, load up on well, the I dogs. think they're trying to uh, sucker a few silly punters in. Oh, don't get me wrong, man. I'd yeah, love it if we won. Um, It'd be fantastic. If you're a Swan supporter and saying, oh, I hope the Swans lose, then uh, let's face it, you're a bit of a flog. But let's um, let's kind of look at things a little bit sort of realistically, you know, glass half full at the moment. It's We're not playing as well as we could be. So I kind of look at these games and go, well, the dogs are not going well, but they're going a lot better than us and they're going to play finals. And the Tigers, they're pretty much there, except for a couple of, Close losses, they should really be top two. So I don't know how we're favourites against the Tigers. That's just silly. No chance. Um, get every dollar you have, put it on the dogs. Yeah, it's looking that way. They've actually got a really good record against us at the SCG as well, um, especially in the last couple of years. Well, that was the yeah. Well, that was the famous the famous win they had a couple of years back. Started their run yep. when they beat us up there in the wet. Yep. Who can forget? Then no, that was that was pretty much the beginning of their. Fairy tale, yeah. because they are all twenty fifteen. Like um, fairy tale run to the to the grand the grand final. Yeah, so. so they did us by four, and then they did us by four again. And the amazing thing is, the scores were almost the same. And uh, then they yep. had that fateful MCG game, and then they did us again earlier this season. Um, look, that game. I just can't see how we are anywhere near a dollar seventy five. We should be two seventy five, and then I still wouldn't back us. I don't get it. That game in round two, we we played well, but. We weren't 23 points down well. We really only had Franklin turning it on for 20 minutes and another one of his incredibly freakish displays that, you know, that you, you look at players like Wayne Carey and you go, mate, you might be good, but you're not a lick on his boot. You've never really done anything insane as that repeatedly throughout your career. Yeah, no, he's, he's, been, worth the, he's been worth the contract, no doubt. Um, you know, he's got a few more years left, obviously, but I hope about in 20. current form, he's a bargain. 20 would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of wishful thinking there, but um, yeah. Oh, just replace his knees, man. Get get some bionic legs on him. Who cares? Get the Blade Runner. And how about and how about chucking him down in that forward 50, Johnny, and uh, getting some goals out oh, of him? Oh, you know, that'd be nice. How about playing Sam Reed as a forward for once? Can't go wrong there, right? Hold on, we're five goals down. I'll put Sam Reed back. Hold on. Hold on, we're five goals up. Put Sam Reed back. I'll put Sam Reed down back. Hold on. That's it. That's game plan Hold A. Oh, and the game just started. Sam Reed, you're going down back. Plan A, play Sam Reed forward. Plan B, play Sam Reed back. Yeah, well, at least he's got Plan B. It's not a good Plan B, but it's a Plan B. He needs to change something up, otherwise he's uh, you know, he's wearing out his welcome pretty yeah, fast. Yeah, he is, unfortunately. I think, I think there's a poll on the big footy board as well, um, which I, I take a look at every now and then. And the uh, yes, sack him option is creeping up every day, so... I think it's about a 35-41 split at the moment, but it was 28-50, I think, a week or two ago. So, Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit scathing, that throat, unfortunately. Um, I I don't think he deserves all the criticism he gets, but you can't really say that this season hasn't been um, a bad one because it's been a season from hell, really. Uh, the And I was having a look at the stats last week. The only season in the last... Oh, Actually, this in, a, in the last 20 years, this is by far the worst season we've had. Uh, you have to go back to 1995 to have a look at a season where we started just as badly as this season with three and seven after 10 rounds. Fortunately, we have a lot of percentage. We've got over 100%. So we do have a pretty good opportunity to turn the season around, and I think we can. <laughs> we played the grand final last year. We really you should be. You're going to back us in to make finals. Oh, we should be turning the season around. I mean, seriously, we should be winning most of the games. The, the team last year would beat almost every single team we play, except maybe Adelaide and Adelaide and maybe Geelong and Geelong. Those are the games I go, oh, I don't know if we could win last year. This year, I kind of look at the Richmond game. 
Yeah, not so sure. I'll look at the dogs game. Yeah, not so sure. Last year, I was really confident, but in it, in order for us to play finals, what do you think that we need to do right? Well, a change of game plan would be nice. Maybe get a bit of output out of some of the senior guys. I mean, Hanabry and Kennedy have lifted the last few weeks, so that's good. Still one missing, which is Luke Parker, who everyone thought was going to just you know patch over the hole that Tom Mitchell's left, but he doesn't seem to be able to stand up. I know there was talk that he was injured early on. Maybe he's still injured. I'm not too sure, but um, yeah, he needs to do I something. I think they're playing him in a um, in a role that he's not really familiar with, or just he's not really well suited to it. Because last year he was playing kind of like a bit of a 30, 35% inside midfielder, but predominantly on the outside and also as a full pocket or half forward. And this year he's had to play 70, 80%, almost 90% game time in the middle in the contest. And we've lost his handballing ability. We've lost his kicking ability. We've lost his marking ability. We've, we've lost his even lead up ability. We've lost a lot of that grunt outside of the contest that he used to provide for us. Well, now that he hasn't got Tom Mitchell you know, spoon-feeding him handballs out of a pack. And I did have a bit of a chuckle when you said kicking ability, by the way. Um, but, you know, he's just he has to earn his own ball now. So until he gets a, another inside mid there dishing him out, I think he's going to struggle. Um, he used to be able to float forward, take a mark. He was one of the better better midfielders overhead. But I think he dropped a couple of those in the weekend. Just didn't look like the same Luke Parker. Um, yeah, needs a bit of a lift. Otherwise, he'll be, I'll be sending him back to the Neeful and, you know, give some... Give, Give a younger bloke a crack in the middle, whether it's Rob, Robbie Fox or someone like that. Love to, but he's on the um, he's on the rookie list, so we need someone to uh, get crocked big time for him to come back in. But uh, I remember last year there were a lot of people in the AFL, journalists, commentators, pundits, fans alike, were comparing Luke Parker and Dustin Martin as you know the two prototypical almost midfielders come half forward flankers or forward pockets just the way that they could win the ball but also go forward and kick ball uh, kick goals can we swap them <laughs> oh we did talk about that last week the guys i uh, i said look if there's anyone wants for luke parker dustin martin and they had a bit of a crack but you know how about a package deal Dip it in parker <laughs> i'm sure well, that was probably raised as well but um i mean i'll chuck in sinclair oh, as well oh god teflon hands <laughs> oh teflon oh steel gloves I think for the Swans to turn it around, um, we've just got to go back to the winning formula, which is man-on-man contested football. It's it's worked for so many years. I, I know that Longmire's tried to change a game plan and they tried to go to the zonal system. But let's face it, every single game we've played the zonal system except for the St. Kilda game, we've been absolutely killed. We, we lost to Carlton playing the zonal system for crying out loud. And granted, the players, they weren't confident. They weren't playing well. They didn't play for each other that game. But we've been killed by the teams that we're trying to to win against. We got killed by the Dogs. We got murdered by the Giants. And those are the two teams that the zonal defense, or at least the zonal game plan, is supposed to help against. Granted, we had a lot of injuries. We had a lot of people down on form. It didn't help. But you can't sort of discount it and say, oh, look, four men injuries. Blah, that's why we lost. You've also got to look at the fact that form also contributed to the game plan and vice versa. That players are doing things they're not necessarily used to or they're playing in a role that they're not necessarily used to or they haven't done before. For instance, Josh Kennedy was playing almost as a centre-half forward or in a forward pocket for the first couple of rounds. Injury or form, I'm not too sure. But you got the probably the best inside winning midfielder playing in a forward pocket for 50% of the game. And yeah, and you got Hanabry playing as the ball winner. Him playing, you know, in the Tom Mitchell role. So I really don't think that the Swans should really persist with something like that. They need to go back to the tried and true formula, the the formula that won us the 2012 grand final, the formula that got us to 2014, 2016, that had us there close enough in 2013 until the, you know, the wheels fell off. And again in 2015, again, the whole wheels fell off again. So I just sincerely hope that John Longmire grabs that game plan, rolls it up and throws it in the bin and sets that bin on fire. Well, clearly the game plan isn't working if the Box Hill Hawks can uh, easily beat us like they did. I mean, something's got to change. I'm not necessarily in the camp of, yes, sack him, that's it. But if he doesn't change his game plan, then what can oh, you look, do? He needs to, I don't know if it's just horse, but I think the coaching staff needs to have a, have a bit of, you know, uh, 
Ross Lyon reflection time. Oh, it's going great. It's going great next week. Nah, season's right off. This game plan's not working. Yeah, it needs to make, make, needs to make some changes. At least change something up. Don't do the same thing. Just, you know, man on man. And I think there was a point raised on the Big 40 Forum where he's he's stuck in this, I think it was Caesar 88. Um, he was He's sort of stuck on this, the blood culture's game plan where you've got to be a, not necessarily the most talented player, but as long as you've you got some grunt and some hard ball gets and that sort of stuff, um, he's happy with that. But is that the way the game's going? It's, I, I'm not too sure why the game plan was changed, considering we had five players in the All-Australian squad last year. Yeah, but I think three of those three of those guys aren't, uh, well, maybe two of those guys aren't playing to form. So I think Parker, a lot of it stems from Parker, um, needs to get a bit more. Look, I think Tom Mitchell was a bigger loss than anticipated. And he's showing that now. I mean, he goes to Hawthorne, he's racking up record numbers. Yeah, fair enough, he gets his little cheapy triangle handballs, one, two, three. But yeah, absolutely. He, he did, the, did the work at Sydney that you didn't see. He was in the pack, getting it out to Parker. Made Parker and look he played better. up the field as well, so, so there was a lot of rotation in there. Effectively, you lose one, but you're actually losing two because, you know, unless someone's there feeding old Lukey, Oh, look, what's done is done. You know, there's no point dwelling on it. And since we're not dwelling on it, let's piss Mitchell off and move on to the next one. Nice, nice segue. segue indeed. <laughs> so, uh, so we'll just touch briefly on the run-in. Now, I want to get your thoughts on the run-in, uh, especially if you think we can win the games or not. Now, round 11, we've got the Western Bulldogs at home. Now, my thoughts on that is that in order to win that game, and we have to win this game. If we want to play finals, we have to win this game. There's there's no option about it. We lose it, forget it. Season's gone. There is no finals. I definitely agree, but I don't think we will. Um, if we do win, it'll just be another band-aid over the, the broken leg because then we'll probably come out and lose to Richmond or whoever we've got the week after. So just the, it's just the way the season's going. And, and And say that we do win both games, would you sort of come back on board and say, oh, look, the season's back on board. This is it. You know, we're going to the finals. Or would you just sort of go, oh, yeah, that's great. And until we play Essendon at the SEG. Well, I'd have more optimism beating the Dogs and Richmond than we did when we beat Brisbane and North. Um, I think everyone was getting a bit carried away after those two wins. But um, beat these two. And, yeah, we're back in it, I guess. But like I said, when you you are read out the run in, I think I probably picked about four of, four of those games to win to go with our three or four that we've got now. So as much as I hate to say it, I think uh, it's time to bring the young guys in. A bit of a change of game plan. At least show you know show the fans that you are willing to mix it up, not just... If we lose, I'd rather lose trying something new, not lose with the game plan that's you know outdated. Absolutely, and look, that might just have to happen. And that just might be the natural progression, especially if we do drop either one of the Western Bulldogs or Richmond games. Now we've got we've got Essendon, sort of the uh, resurgent bombers, I guess you could kind of call them. They've been fluctuating throughout the year, and that's to be expected, given the fact that so many of their players have come back from from that sort of year long layoff without any football. Um, they're doing all right. They're doing all right. They um, they gave Geelong a pretty healthy touch up, but uh, they've been uh, pretty ripe for picking occasionally. How do you feel about that game? Yeah, we should win, but. Then again, we should have beat Carlton. Um, you know, we should have beat Hawthorne. So you would think we would win, but don't be surprised if we get yeah, pumped. Yeah, no, that's true. Look, I'm uh, I'm putting that down as a win. Um, we absolutely mauled them last year. They were pretty good in the first half, but we gave them a pretty solid touch-up. Yeah, but we were pretty good last year too. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of conditional on that, isn't it? Maybe there's maybe we're kind of uh, reflecting too much on what was instead of I think I what think you're uh, stuck in the past. You sound like an Eagles supporter, the Mummies uh, boys. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe the secrets in the wags. Who knows? <laughs> maybe maybe the uh, maybe the Swans need to bring the wags back to the SEG. The way they play there at home, they've been bloody awful this year. I think Josh Kennedy needs to bring his uh, what was he Colombian? Colombian? Yes. I think she I think she needs to uh, come down more yeah, often. Maybe. Well, after the Bombers, we've got the Demons at the MCG. Happy return. Well, we've got a pretty good record against them, so um, same deal. Who knows? I think we'll win. That's that's one of my four wins. We do have a pretty good record against them. We've actually won the last five 
um, three of them at the SCG, oh, sorry, MCG. Um, we've done it by a part, well, if you take away the 100 point win, we've done it by an average of seven goals. So we've had a pretty, pretty good run against them. Um, yeah, we should touch them yeah, up. Yeah, look, our recent record over the last 12 games is 10 wins, one draw, and one loss. So if we lost this, that really is curtains. And to be honest, that's just like chuck it in, go on home sort of business. Yeah. We'll know by then if it's curtains or not. Oh, so. yeah. Oh, look, if we lost that game, I'd be kind of thinking it's curtains regardless. Um, then we got then we got the Suns at the SCG. I'll actually be up there for that game. I'm really looking forward to it. Um. I would be really disappointed if we lost this game. That would that would really hurt. We've never lost to them. Well, that'll be on par with the that'll be on par with the Carlton no. loss, really. I mean, this would be the next level. Like we have never lost to the Suns. We have only thrashed them. Yeah, but but the Suns have got some talent. They're finally starting to not rely on Gary Ablett. You know, so we've got no one to play on Tom Lynch. He's probably going to kick fifteen on us. <laughs> um, let's just hope Buddy can kick sixteen because that's our only game plan, and uh, you know, get the win. But you would think they'd win. Oh, so. Yeah, yeah, if they didn't. You'd hope, anyway. Then we've got uh, probably the hardest match of the second half of the season at uh, Spotless Stadium against GWS on Saturday the 15th of July. Now, um, Yeah, we could lose that by about 120 <laughs> points, I'd say. <laughs> that depends entirely on injury list and whether or not Stevie Johnson's playing, I reckon. Because if he's playing... and Injury list? They've got 10 players out and they're still pumping people. So uh, if they get them back, it's going to be a 200-point point loss. And it depends on whether or not Tippett and Johnson are playing because if Johnson's playing and Tippett's playing, I don't think Tippett's you know, seen out the first quarter. Well, I'd give us a better chance to win without Tippett in the team. So let's hope he doesn't play. The last couple of times he's lined up against GWS, it, it has not been has not been a pretty sight. He's, he's been an unfortunate guy against them. Uh, then we've got the Saints at the SCG. Uh, that's a bit of a, which is actually really interesting um, because at Etihad, we have a fantastic record against him at Etihad. From 2012, we hadn't lost to him. That that really god awful game that we played there, we'd won tons of games in a row. And we've also got a really good record against him more recently at the SCG, but it wasn't that long ago at the SCG that we actually had a really poor record against them where they were beating us. They beat us uh, by two points. Um, we had that draw. They beat us by a point. But more recently, we've won nine of the last ten. So they're not a bad team this season. We you know, we gave them a touch-up. What do you think? Yeah, they're definitely a good team, improved, and they'll make the eight for sure. But we do match up well, and I think... Buddy kicked a bag last time yeah, on them. Yeah, he certainly did. I think four goals turned on the last quarter. Yeah, so he's got a pretty good rec. Yeah, pretty good record against them. He'll probably go crazy and kick half a dozen. So I reckon that's another win. All right, then we're following it up with a grudge match. Should I really say who the team is? Uh, the scummiest of the scum yeah, scum. The scummiest. They don't come more scummier. Yeah, look, if we uh, <laughs> if we lose that, I'm going to be steamed. Um, if we're, to- if we're talking about recent head-to-heads, uh, we're pretty solid against the Hawks at the MCG. Much more solid yeah, than... Yeah, we couldn't do it when it mattered, though. Oh, not so. when it mattered, but... Um, and this is the really the really frustrating thing, is that at the MCG, we've won the last two games, but at the SCG, we've lost a bag of games to them. So I'd rather play them at the Dome than the SCG. Definitely rather play them at Eddie Head. Um, but it's where it is, so... It's a loss for me. Look, hands down, they are our bogey team. They've actually won. Along with Richmond, they're definitely a bogey oh, team. Oh, look, Hawks have won eight of the last 11 against us. So even, it doesn't matter if they get thrashed by 100 points, they'll turn up. They did it. You exactly. know they're going to turn up. You've you got to expect it. And the fact that the team didn't expect it last time. They do. They, they do exactly what Sydney claimed to do. Stand up, be professional. Everyone plays their role, do their bit. We didn't do it last week, and look what happened. So well, and then we've got Geelong. That's looking like a <laughs> pass. Yeah, yeah, pass. Skip. <laughs> Not going to bother. Fremantle at home at the SEG. Oh, we should tell oh, them should up. Be. if we don't far out. Um, we've got Adelaide at Adelaide Oval. Pass. 
Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Look, uh, I, if there's ever one time I go to Adelaide Oval to watch Adelaide play, it'd be against the Swans. And to be honest, I'd probably even buy an Adelaide top at Eddie Betts number on it. Just, just for that reason only. That guy is a star. And how good would it be in red and white? It's never going to happen. But geez, I love watching him play. Yeah, he's a... Uh... He's up there. He's he's probably better than Dacos. Oh, he's now a talent for being consistent. Not, not only is he a talent, but he's such a such a nice guy. He, there's no hint of arrogance about him whatsoever. Just a good old fashioned, you know, good old fashioned footy player. So, and then don't know what Carlton don't know what Carlton will think of getting rid of well, him, but they've done a few of it. So. <laughs> Josh Kennedy, Eddie Betts. Well, and the funny thing is, after Adelaide, we got Carlton at the ESCG. Yeah, we'll win that. So that, that's five wins. So we're finishing on eight wins for the year. So that's pretty good. We'll be eight wins after, what, 17, 18 months? And it doesn't even give us a good enough draft pick. So it's just, it's nothing. It's a nothingness. It's a, what will that be, a, a 12th to 14th finish. Hopefully it's 14th if we're that low. Um, get us a couple of high picks, but it's sort of a nothing ground. All we so. can hope is that we uh, go on a run and we win six or seven in a row. Not likely, but that's our best chances for making the finals. And um, hopefully, yeah. look, we've kind of touched on the Bulldogs game, and we've touched on the head-to-head. But let's go into uh, let's go into the matchup matchups of the game, and let's sort of have a look at what the Swans need to do to win it, and who the uh, main players are going to be. So uh, for mine, I think we're going to see a bit of a um, bit of head-to-head for Kennedy and Bontempelli in the middle. What about you? Yeah, that that a lot will hinge on that. Um, I've got down here Stringer and Rampy. Oh, so yes. Rampy can Rampy can keep him quiet. We might be a chance, but uh, the other big one is we need to tag the umpires. <laughs> it's it's got to be done. Um, yep. Too influential. Best on ground. The last few games we've played him, shut him down, and we should have a chance. We so, need we need um we need Malcheski running through. Bring back Brett Kirk. Chuck him onto uh, Scott Jeffrey or whoever, whoever it is this week and. Uh, yeah, you get the job oh, done. Look, we need Malcheski taking him out again. That was the only good thing he did for a while. I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> he took out Troy Pennell when Pennell was turned around and he's just plowed straight through him and tr- poor old Troy Pennell, he didn't get back on the field for a while after that. No, it's a shame he didn't retire him. <laughs> well, uh, we've got Sam Reed and Jack Lloyd coming back. Oh, man, did we miss them, especially Jack Lloyd. But uh, other other sort of matchups, I don't know if um, I don't know if Libba's back in yet. There was, I had a bit of a read on the the Bulldogs forum on Big Footy, and they're all campaigning for him to come back in. So, but then there's a bit of bit of a rumor there that something is going on in the back background. So we all know he likes a bit of a party. Whether that's getting in the way of his football now or not, I'm not too sure. But a few of the guys over on the board want him in. Yeah, so. well, it looks like it has. His um, head's been turned big time this year. He's been nowhere near his best. Maybe he needs to go out on a, a night on the pingers and wake up on a park bench <laughs> yeah. again and get back into some form. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a bit like that, unfortunately. But um, we've also got Liam Picken. Uh, that's a big one for Smith. He has to shut him down because Liam Picken, he's, he's a gut runner and he always stands up in the big moments. He did it in the grand final. He did it in round two. He does it when they need him the most. I still have nightmares about that last quarter, so thanks for bringing that up. Uh, then we've also got McRae. Have to shut him down. McRae, yeah, he'll get his 30 touches, kick a goal or two. Hopefully Toby McLean's not playing, the old serial ducker. Nothing pisses me off more than, I don't mind us losing, but to lose in that way. Tunnel ball, ducking, all that sort of shit. Oh, uh, look, we've also uh, got to shut down Jason Johannesson. So if Rowan's playing... That's who he goes to, and he's got to play defensive, in my mind, on that. I'm not playing, Justin. Fortunately, you're not Gary Rowan. <laughs> 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 but if, if, we, uh, if we stand any chance of shutting down their uh, halfback flank run, that, that's him. And um, I mean, he gives them a bit of bounce off halfback. He, he does butcher the ball a bit, but he gives them that drive. But I think we should just, on that subject, we should just counter him and put, put Gary Rowan on our back 50 and... Tell him to do what he does and see how we go. I mean, what's the worst can happen? Well, we did that against the Hawks and uh, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. And the worst happened. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> it did not work. Well, and that, that's why I've been a bit critical of Malikan lately because he's as promising as he's been. He just doesn't have the pace to go against those quicker guys. And he got absolutely caught up by Gunston. 
um, and Ruffy ran him over too. So no, nah, I think he, he's he's not big enough to be a shutdown defender, and he's not quick enough to be a running defender. He's so kind of in the middle. Whether he's a take the second or third tall, I'm not too sure. He's he's got a bit about him. He's got some nice composure. He does he really does? And he's clean. But, he's very clean. But he's in he, he's an in betweener. He, he doesn't. Uh-huh, really, he's a tweener. You know he's. He, He's a tweener. He can't take the big animals, like the big gorillas. Not but, yet, he can't. And then he can't match on one of Johannesson. No, I don't so. think he's ever going to develop into a fullback type, but if he can take that third tall and be clean with his hands, that's all we can ask. But Oh, well, now, <laughs> so uh, we already know your kind of thoughts about the Dogs game, but uh, what are your predictions? Give me three predictions. Three predictions from the Dogs game. We will lose. <laughs> oh. I will make a fortune when I bet on it, and the umpires will have an influence. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. That's three sure things right there. Three sure things. I like them. Safer than bank interest, Uh, that is. Put your house on it. Safer than banks. I like it. If if I had a house, I'd put it on it. Sataris, sell your Singaporean mansion and put all your Singaporean dollars (laughs) on the dogs this week. (laughs) Yeah, he won't go near it. Not with a barge ball, mate. All right, now that's good. I like them. Um, so, my three predictions. Uh, I think I'm going to go a little bit more football related than uh, making a fortune. I don't really punt that heavily. Um, yeah, I think the game's going to be decided by under two goals. I uh, I think Franklin's going to kick five goals, and I reckon Lloyd's going to come back in and he's going to have his 33 disposals and be, and be influential after halfback flank. So those those are my three predictions. All three of those are very much possible. Oh, look, if they're not dead set certainties, I'm going to I'm going to go in my little corner and I'm going to rock backwards and forwards and I'm going to cry. Maybe you should head over to the predictions uh, thread on Big Footy. Put your predictions in and show us how it's done. Yeah, I've done that before and I've looked like a bit of a fool, so I think I'll pass. Yeah, that that was a shameless plug. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm skipping that one. Pass, as we've been saying. <laughs> All right. Now, um, we've had a couple of our listeners be kind enough to uh, put in a couple of questions for us to answer. Uh, you were feeling up to it, mate? Oh, yeah, just... Uh, yeah, we'll All right, cool. Well, we've got uh, Skeparovic from Bigfooty. He's uh, fired us in three questions. How can Spawns improve their centre clearances given the form of the current players? Well, we can start by dropping Stinclair. Um, maybe maybe get an inside mid that can win a ball. Maybe put Zach Jones in there. He's got a bit of toughness. He can he can get it out to the other guys. But um, bring Nace within. Nace is a good tap ruckman. Although Sinclair's been playing well the last few weeks, as much as it kills me to say it, um, he's not the greatest ruckman. He's good. He's not too bad around the ground. He tries his best, but Nace Nace Smith as a pure ruckman uh, in the middle. That's all I can think of, really. Oh, look, I think Naismith definitely improves the uh, center, the center structure. And you could tell last year when we had, um, it was Sinclair and um, Nankovis, no, believe it or not. And you know, people are raving about Nankovis. Nank the Nank tank. Nank the tank, man. That guy couldn't rock for shit, but he could certainly play around the ground. And we had them last year before the Geelong game when Naismith played his first game. God, that rock combination is awful, especially the Eagles game. Couldn't win a tap at all against one of the most athletic ruckmen you'll ever see, but just couldn't get a tap at all. Then we um, brought in Naismith, and yeah, the change has been absolutely you know massive for us. But would it surprise you to know that Sinclair actually outrucked Tippett on the weekend? Not at all, because it's uh, it's Tippett, and that's probably where I think at the moment the centre clearances and the centre structure is really fallen down. Is the fact that we haven't had any regular, constant, dependable feeding of the ball down to the midfielders or even just being able to read the play off their own ruckman or even rove the ball off them, even if it's in you know contest or it's not a clear hit out. I think because we just haven't been competitive enough in there. I think we just need to leave Sinclair in the middle, do as best as he can, put Tippett down at full forward, leave him there, do a bit of rucking around the ground, but keep him out of the middle because who knows, he'll... he'll, he'll a bit of knee on knee, and he's likely to snap in half. Um, but leave Sinclair to the centre, get some forward structure, leave Tippett down there, see if he can clunk one or two, and yeah, surely it's better than what we're doing at the moment. I think another thing that Swans players could possibly do is maybe watch some tapes. Because let's face it, against St Kilda, we got absolutely killed in the centre clearances early in the game. They were up, I think, 9-2 to two at one point. We turned it around, and that was one of the reasons why we won the game. 
We've been killed in the centre clearances. All we have to do is all we have to do is break even with the yep. Ruckman. Sinclair doesn't have to win it. Just break even, get it to feet, let Kennedy do his stuff. Um, whoever else is in there on the rotation, but you can't have them spoon feeding the opposition mids like they've been doing. It's just um, just kills it. All right, next one again from Skabarovic. What changes would you like to see between now and the end of the season? Um, well, I know we've tried it before, but I still want to see Gary Rowan off a half back. Use his speed. I mean, he's probably already peaked and he's shown us what he's capable of. I think he, what is he, 26, maybe? 27? Yeah, bring back the slingshot. He's got the pace. That's his biggest weapon. Uh, we've tried him up forward. Shows glimpses, but just doesn't do it long enough. So mix that around. Um, Sinclair keeps his spot as much as people know I don't rate him that highly. Um, he's, he's, shown, he's shown form. The last month, you can't fault him. He tries hard. He can't take a mark. He, um, yeah, but all you can ask for is a bit of effort, and he gives us that, which is something that Tippett doesn't do. So if anyone's going to drop out of the two Ruckman, I'd rather see Sinclair and Naismith. Yeah, but you know they're never going to drop Tippett. Not, not unless he's uh, injured again. Wouldn't want to swallow their pride. Changes, changes. I, um, I don't disagree with that. And to be honest, I would. I can't really disagree. I just want to see us bring back Aaliyah. I don't know what he's doing. I don't know what's going on. But if there's a change that needs to be made, Aaliyah has to come in, and that's going to have a. It's going to have an immediate sort of domino effect throughout the side. It's going to allow Mills to push further into the middle. It's going to take a bit of the strain off the defense to have to really always force a rebound through Jones to force it through Rampy and Lloyd because Aaliyah does that superbly. Not only can he read the play, but he can mark the ball. He can handball like you've not, never seen. He's like Pendlebury in space. You know, he creates space where there is no space. He's got pace to burn. And his kicking is absolutely superb. He is an extremely talented footballer who is, in my opinion, not a particularly good defender. He's almost too tall to be a kind of like a flanker. But the way he reads the ball, I haven't really seen many players do that. He could become the loose man in defence if we can somehow work it. So I don't know if John Longmire's got it in him to outcoach anyone, but if they can somehow swing it that he's the loose man in defence... He could just chop him up, get 30 touches, 10 intercept marks, yeah. 13 rebound 50s, and just, just kill well, it. Well, we but, talked about it last yeah. uh, last episode, especially the fact that Aaliyah had played forward in the reserves on that previous weekend. So you know, there could be a bit of something where you know maybe they are developing him to be a bit of a swing forward and defender, kind of like a bit more, a bit of a better Adam Hunter than sort of Sam Reed has been. Because you know, Sam Reed has been good, but... His best football by a mile has been in attack, and we're killing him by playing him in defence. So, look, if we lose him and we keep Aaliyah, I don't like our chances of keeping Aaliyah if we're not playing him. But my my changes has to be Aaliyah has to play. I don't, I don't care if he's, you know, taking a hammer to Longmire's knees, put him in because the change to the side is, you know, it's massive. It really is. Now, the next one. What would leave you satisfied the most as a supporter between now and the end of the season? Um, that's a good question. Just a change of game plan. Just show us that you can change up. You're not stuck in your, your plan A. Just If we lose, lose trying something new, not not what we've been doing. Um, that's probably about it. I'm not in the, I don't want him to get sacked this week, next week, if he changes it up. Then if we get pumped, then reassess, but... You know, while he's playing the same old, outdated game style, you're just going to keep losing. No, that's fair enough. Look, um, mine is that uh, I would be pretty happy that even if we don't make the finals, I would be absolutely delighted if we made the finals because if we do, I think we're as good as chance as any to actually make it all the way through. If we don't make the finals and we miss them, then I would like us to beat Adelaide and Geelong and Hawthorne. Um, it would be really nice to be GWS, but those three in particular, Hawthorne, Geelong and Adelaide, that would make me pretty happy as a supporter, I think, for the rest of the year. As long as they show effort. Absolutely. That's that's the good enough, you know, just show their effort. Four quarters. Now, the last one. This one comes from uh, Andrew on <laughs> Big Footy. Do you miss shiny metal? Now, 
for those who aren't aware of Shiny Metal, could you please elaborate on who or what Shiny Metal actually is? Well, Shiny Metal. Now, there's a name. Um, he's sort of like this mythical creature that sort of floats around the Bigfooty forums, <laughs> um, pops up one day, a newest member, and he's already got moderator privileges. So not sure who he is, but he's, uh, he's got a bit of pull, the old Shiny Metal. But do I miss him? Not a chance. I can't say anything because I have no idea who Shiny Metal is. So do I miss him? Ah, uh, no idea, mate. Not a clue who he is. That's pretty much it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me, Rowan. It's been a pleasure having you on. No dramas, Chumpy. Thank you very much. Push one to the front of the bus gets Martin's lunch money. What? Go apple! Go orange! Banana! Wellingham! Wellingham goal! Arazio Fantasia. Intercepted almost by Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia in there. Here's Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Tip and Woody. Little quick handball over the top. Lewenberger. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Here's Arazio Fantasia. Has two goals. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. Arazio Fantasia. I get the feeling you like Arazio Fantasia as a name. Yeah, I do. I do.